Uh, this is part three of lecture five on uh, wideband channel measurement systems. In first part, uh, we talked about uh, introduction, what is the meaning of time domain measurement, and what is pulse transmission technique. In the second part, we talked about direct sequence spread spectrum and sliding correlator. And uh, in the third part, uh, well, th that part, direct sequence spread spectrum and sliding correlator, most of the lecture was description of the sliding correlator and direct sequence, which had not much to do with uh, wideband uh, results of measurements. But it was very good to correlate the, uh, to show the relationship between channel measurement system and transmission techniques. Really, foundation of transmission can be understood out of channel measurement system because channel measurement system are wideband communication systems. So we understand them much better actually here. Anyway, and now uh, we are uh, in this third part, we are talking about frequency domain measurement systems and uh, in general frequency domain measurements. Basically, uh, what is the incentive of frequency domain measurement as I perhaps told you earlier also, uh, this frequency measurement systems, or the way that we discuss it, started in around late 1980s. And at that time, very expensive network analyzers were introduced into the market. And these network analyzers at that time are like the one that we bought in our lab was like $37,000. The, one, the latest one that I have in my lab is like $120,000. That's the one that we have. But the one that we had earlier was measuring up to like uh, 6 gigahertz. And this one, the one that I have new, measures up to 40 gigahertz. So what do they do? Really, they are like a sort of systems which they are sending a very narrow pole, uh, sorry, a very uh, yeah, narrow band pulse, just like a cosine, and they change that frequency of the cosine in discrete format. Okay, and they do it very quickly. So you have one output which sends the cosine and changes the frequency of the cosine, and you have an input which receives the signal, correlates it with the transmitted signal, and gives you like magnitude and phase of the medium in between, whatever it is. It could be a transistor, could be a resistor, could be whatever. So it's a network analyzer. But if we apply the network analyzer to the air, and I mean, I transmit the signal through this, and I receive it in here. In between, the medium is my channel. So I'm measuring the frequency response of the channel. Because I'm changing the frequency from one point to another point. But I'm not sending many pulses, uh, many, many signals. I send only one cosine. But it must be very fast because I sweep the channel. I sweep in frequency domain, not in time. I sweep the channel and I come back. The typical um, one measurement of sweeping the channel depends on the number of frequencies that you want to jump. For something around like, I mean, most of our, our measurements were something like 200 or 400 earlier measurements. More accurate measurement that we are doing more recently for time of arrival estimation, we use something like 1,600 points. So you have like a bandwidth which is 100 megahertz or 200 megahertz, and you have 200 points. So you get that divided by 200. That's like the distance spacing that you have. Okay, But it's a very simple system simple measurement system. Like a sliding correlator, I mean, it's a very complex, a lot of boxes. And when you want to do measurement, you have to move these things around. They are very difficult. And also, you need a radio engineer to connect those things together. A pulse transmission technique is a little bit less complex than a sliding correlator. But this one is absolutely the simplest. And also, it has one advantage over uh, over the 
uh, over the pulse transmission technique this one provides uh, like better coverage because similar to that pulse length see if you have like a cosine and the amplitude of the cosine stays the same and you transmit across across the bandwidth always you have the same power again so you don't have that the ratio of the peak to minimum power is constant is one which is very good for radio communication you can send more power so you have better coverage and also it provides coherent modulation because when I send the cosine at the receiver I measure the magnitude and phase of that so I have in phase and quadrature phase both of them so it's not like it's like an in phase quadrature phase system so these are the advantage of the system but so basically what you do you have I think we saw this measurement system when we were talking about narrowband measurements basically we have a bunch of amplifiers at the transmitters which are power amplifiers and at the receivers we have a bunch of like uh, preamps okay these are two sets of amplifiers and sometimes we put some sort of attenuators in between to make sure that receive signal is not too much to burn the system but pre in principle it's very simple fairly very simple mathematically speaking what you're doing in frequency domain you're basically measuring h f of t okay which is the fourier transform of the channel impulse response on delay variable not on the time variable you remember that impulse response is function of two things is a two dimensional function one is t which is the real time what is tau tau is delay of arrival okay so tau is associated to different paths length of different paths t is just absolute time now if I take Fourier transform with tau that would be this h of f okay now the channel impulse response always was what was like a, if you remember I mean for indoor areas you had like these impulses arriving a bunch of impulses Fourier transform of impulses are a bunch of phasers so Fourier transform of this thing if I take it is a bunch of amplitudes bunch of phases and a bunch of time of arrivals in this format this is what I'm measuring okay now if you want to have like a picture for that for example uh, uh, that's one typical picture what I measure in frequency this is the frequency response this is the phase of the frequency response okay this is what I'm measuring this is coming from 900 to 1100 megahertz 900 to 11 meg each point in here has a magnitude and it has a phase which is in here and when I change the frequency that phase and magnitude are changing now if I take the inverse Fourier transform of this that's the channel impulse response but let's come back to here so basically how do I measure this thing again if it's a function of t and tau and both of them are changing I cannot measure it but if the channel is a slow time varying means that this variable t this is my time it's changing slowly before channel changes I can do one snapshot measurement means that channel is changing at the rate of what at the rate of fd which is my Doppler spectrum then what I do is that I have to do my measurements with inverse of that divided by 2 but anyways if the channel is slowly changing before the channel changes I can measure the frequency response of the channel now time response of the channel was something like this was a bunch of impulses and this was the time response something like that which we couldn't create impulses 
So we would observe something like this. This was my time domain. Okay? All the pulse technique were measuring something like this. This was time domain. Now, in frequency domain, you measure the Fourier transform of this, which is something like that, by sending these frequencies. I mean, these different frequencies. You're measuring these different frequencies. Response in these different frequencies. This is what you do in frequency domain. You measure this thing, which is Fourier transform of what? Impulse response. Impulse response was h of tau t. And if it's a slow time varying, it was really h of tau. This is the Fourier transform of h, h, h of tau, which I call it what? h of f. This is what I'm measuring. But in reality, is h of f and t. And since channel is very slow time varying, is h of f at any given time. OK? So coming back to this equation, I'm measuring h of f, which is Fourier transform of impulse response. And my impulse response happened to be something like, again, h of t in discrete format was something like k or i equal to 1 to l, beta i, delta of t minus or tau minus if I call it this h of tau, that's better. Tau minus tau i, e to the j phi. This, is, this was the impulse response. If I take the Fourier transform of that, this would be h of f, which is sigma i equal to 1 to l. This is linear beta i. What is the Fourier transform of impulse shifted is only a phasor, a omega tau tau. And the e to the j, this is a constant Fourier transform. Does it make sense? So Fourier transform of impulse is this thing. These are all constants. They come in there. So I have a bunch of, actually, phasors which are added together at different frequencies. So they add differently at different frequencies, so they give me these ups and downs. When I change the frequency, these phases quickly change. So the combination of the phaser changes. So it goes up and down. And you remember that this thing in frequency domain, we refer to that as what? Frequency selective fading. But again, what is the cause of frequency selective fading is, again, the fact that phase is changing very quickly. Tau sub i. Tau sub i. If I change this f a little bit, a little bit of change in f will change. This is a bunch of phasers. As soon as I change the f a little bit, I have a new set of phasers. They have the same amplitudes, but now the phases are different. So at this point, for example, let's say I have three paths. They add like this, and they give me this. I come a little bit later, the phases change, and they come like this. So in here is a strong, in here is medium. And when I come in here, some of them go in this direction, some of them come in the reverse direction. So they give me this fade. But what changed the phases? That was changing the frequency. Do you follow me? So I have a bunch of paths. Let's say I have three paths. I change the frequency. In the old time, I was changing the time. Now I'm changing the frequency. If I change the frequency a little bit, the magnitude of the tree remains almost the same. But this is the phase which changes. Phase changes very rapidly. So suddenly it goes down. This time, this is in terms of frequency. And that's why that I call it frequency selective fading. If I have multi-path, I have it. If I have single path, I don't have it. OK? And I will have multi-path when I have wide bandwidth. OK? So now coming back in here, so basically I'm measuring like, coming back to the computer now, I'm measuring like beta i, a bunch of phasers with different amplitudes, different phases. And as I change the frequency, these phases are changing, so I have ups and downs. 
And if I take the inverse Fourier transform of these ups and downs, I get H of T. It's a bunch of arriving impulses. Associated to each, inf uh, each phaser, I have one of those arriving pulses from different paths. Now, but now, uh, so this is the basic concept. So I have a bunch of paths which are arriving in different times. In frequency domain, they are a bunch of phasers with different phases at different frequencies. And that's it. So rather than measuring the impulse response, I measure the frequency response. And I take the inverse Fourier transform, I have the time response. And that's the basic for my system. No magic involved. Now, but there is now some technical issues. When I do the measurement in frequency domain, I measure from the frequency of 900 megahertz to 1.1 gigahertz, for example. Okay? What should be my assumption for the frequencies before and after that? I cannot measure all the frequencies. I have to chop it at some time. If I assume everything after that is zero, then it is equivalent to assuming that I take the signal and I put a rectangular window on top of that. Is that right? So really the frequency response, if I look at the frequency characteristics, I want to get the frequency characteristics from minus to plus infinity. Huh? I want it in all frequencies, and then take the inverse Fourier transform, if this is like H of F, and then I take the inverse Fourier transform, and then I have my complete H of T. But I cannot do that. I cannot do that. All the frequencies are limited. So I come from here to here. So always I have a W bandwidth, and I'm just measuring from here to here. No matter what I measure. And after that, it is zero. Okay? So basically, what I'm doing actually, I have the real channel impulse, channel frequency response. I have multiplied that with a window, which is a rectangular window. Okay? So let's say that, like, I have, I'm doing the measurement, huh? Let's say that I have a channel which is perfect. I mean, my transmitter receiver are only one meter apart. So I sweep the channel. The channel must be like this, flat, flat. But I'm measuring between 900 to 1100. So since I'm measuring like that, I'm measuring from here to here. What is the impulse response of that? When I get the inverse Fourier transform of this, impulse response would be what? A sink in time. But if I was staying one meter apart, what was the impulse response? Ideally, was like one impulse. Huh? What is the difference between one impulse and this? If I take the magnitude of this, in magnitude, these are like this. I have these so-called side lobes. OK? And the side lobes of the rectangular window is like 13 dB below the peak. So if I go now in a multipath environment, you follow me up to here. I go to a multipath environment, and I measure the frequency like bandwidth of 200 megahertz. My bandwidth is only 200 megahertz. OK? And then I have like this side lobe. I mean, I mean, I will have like pulses like this in ideal condition and this thing is like 13 dB below the side is 13 dB below ok this is my one of my paths now what if I have what is the width of this is like 5 nanosecond which is like inverse of this 200 megahertz ok now what if I have two paths I mean another path comes like another sink pulse, like this, comes like this. And if this guy is more than 13 dB less than this, I cannot see it. It goes under the side lobe of the other guy. Huh? So I'm measuring what? I'm measuring multipath. I want to see how many paths has arrived. So this side lobe is very important. I mean, for rectangular window, I have a side lobe of 13 dB. Means that if I have another path, 
which is like more than 13 dB, I can see it. If it's less than 13 dB, I don't see it. So what is your solution now? What can I do? Classical filter design techniques. If you remember, always in the design of filters, what do you do? Rectangular filters are not good. You don't like it. You use other windows. Like you use Hamming windows, Hamming windows, those windows like rectangular, or windows like this. What is the advantage of these windows? These windows, for example, Hamming window, will reduce the side lobes to 44 dB. So now I can get a lot more paths. But what is the disadvantage of that? Disadvantage is that the width of the pulse goes more than 5 nanoseconds, goes to like 7, 8 nanoseconds. So I lose in the resolution, but I will have more of what? More of multipath component. This has always been there. Okay? When I have data in the limited range, whether it is in time domain or in frequency domain, if I apply a window to that, I have to compromise always between what? Width of the window, which is my resolution, and number of things that I can like detect, huh? which is my signal to noise ratio, if you want to call. The same issue exists in here. Now, what we do with the windows, so, in reality, what we are measuring, come back to the computer, what I'm measuring, in fact, rather than H of F that I had in here, now I'm getting an H of F, which is WF, the window, multiplied with the Fourier transform of the channel impulse response, which is a bunch of phasers. Okay? Now, if I, I don't measure this thing in frequency domain, in continuous form, I do the samples of that. And these are the samples. If I sample at like delta F times K, then I will get like samples of this thing at F equals to K times delta F. So basically, the samples of frequency domain that I'm measuring, the samples are basically summation of beta i, which are amplitude of the paths, phi i and tau sub i in this format, and these guys sampled at k equals to delta, uh, at delta f. Okay, so this was like my frequency response. Difference between two samples in here that I'm taking because I'm calculating the sample frequency response. Difference between these two is this thing, is delta F. Okay, so this is what I'm measuring. And then how do I calculate the time domain of that? I have applied the window to that, so I take the samples of the frequency domain like this and multiply it with this windows and multiplied with this phaser to get the inverse Fourier transform, which is this one. This is the impulse response in time. Huh? So what you're measuring is that you're measuring a bunch of free, uh, measuring the channel impulse response in a bunch of frequencies. Then you weight them with this window, and then you get the inverse Fourier transform, and this is your channel impulse response. You follow that? Very simple then, up to now. So I calculated, I measured this H of Ks, I weighted them with the windows, I multiplied them with the phaser to get the inverse Fourier transform, which is the channel impulse response. Okay, but this channel impulse response, again, I want to sample it, so I can do inverse discrete Fourier transform, or the so-called Tripsy transform, for example, they call it. I can sample this at any place that I want. Now, so basically, if I want to again put like in terms of equations, 
see. I have measured basically h of k from measurements. So somebody went to the network analyzer, got these samples, 201 samples, and then I have sigma k equal to 0 n minus 1. But before I use these samples, I multiply them with wf or wk. These are that window, samples of the window. This is the window that I have, samples of this window. If it's rectangular, these are all one. If it's hamming, these are samples of this window. And then I multiply it with like e to the j omega like t, that's omega k. Now times tau times delta f. I mean k delta f is the, sorry, this is going to be 2 pi. So in a sense, it's it's 2 pi delta f times k times tau. OK, this is the whole thing. Because for the Fourier transform, I get the samples. I multiply it with e to the j omega tau. OK, and then this omega is. 2 pi f times tau, and this f in here is k times delta f, because I have samples of the frequency. OK, now, the, anyways, what I get in here is h of tau, h of tau, which is impulse response in tau, which is a continuous function, continuous function. Now, this continuous function, h of tau, which was h of k, w of k, e to the j 2 pi k, k tau times delta f. Delta f comes in here. OK? So now this is a continuous function. But if I want to calculate it rather than tau, I have to put samples. Every, like, whatever that I want, I can put. I don't need to put, like, any specific thing. If I put any, anything arbitrary in here for samples, it's called Tripsy transform. OK, so if I get this h of tau, and rather for tau, I put like n, little n, times ts. And this ts has nothing to do with anything else, which is sigma like wk, hk, e to the j, k, delta f. And then rather than tau, I put n ts. If I put this thing, I have samples of the impulse response. If it was this impulse response, I have these samples. This distance of these samples is like t sub s. And it is repeating itself because this is like Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform in the discrete form is periodic. Okay? Since it is periodic, this is going to be repeating itself every one over delta f in time. Okay, it's just repeating a periodic function that I take in time. Now, in, in the figure, if you want to see, this is what I'm doing really. What I'm doing is that I'm sending a bunch of frequencies, which are from f zero up to f zero plus n, n delta f. They are like delta f apart. It's samples. Okay, and then at the receiver, I receive a bunch of the same things but with different magnitudes and phase. I take these things with different magnitude and phase. I multiply each of them with a weighted factor, which is my window. This is my window. And then I take the Tripsy transform. What is Tripsy transform? That's the one that I told you. That's the same equation that I have in here, this equation. That's this equation, this equation, sampled arbitrarily. I mean, with any TS that you like. OK? That is basically what I have in here. This is my impulse response. Now, 
this, this impulse response is periodic. One period is one over delta F. That's one thing. The distance between two samples is delta T. OK? Now, if I want to do a measurement system like that, and this is periodic, again, period in time should be how much? Do you remember? The same as like post-transmission technique. This should be more than what? Tau S, which was multi-path spread. Tau M, I think I call it. Maximum multi-path spread. I want to measure what? The impulse response of the channel. The impulse response goes with multi-path spread. If my multi-path spread is 200 nanosecond, this thing should be 1 over delta F, should be what? More than that 200 nanosecond. Otherwise, it aliases, because in time it's always periodic. Did you follow that? So again, I'm stuck with that periodic thing. But this time, the periodic thing is in my hand. I calculate the delta F, and it's not like something that I see. It's a sort of, it's a sort of hidden. Huh? It's like virtual periodic time that I receive. Huh? But still, I have the same thing. My period in here is 1 over delta F. And this 1 over delta F should be bigger than my multipath spread. Otherwise, when I get the inverse Fourier transform, I will have the so-called aliasing. And I would have the same aliasing in time type of measurement system. OK, so that's one thing that I got in here. The second issue is that, how about this delta t? How about how much should be the delta t? Like, delta t should be small enough that it can resolve the multipath components. So this is, again, very similar to those samples of a sliding correlator output or samples of like pulse that we receive at the receiver huh? it should be what let's say much less than tau sub m hmm? that's another thing that I have in here now but Fourier transform of discrete to discrete always is what? Two-sided. Like, I mean, uh, I have to be very careful about this sampling stuff. If I had, like, now let's say 200 megahertz bandwidth. If I had, like, 200 megahertz bandwidth, okay, then in time, I will receive pulses which are like 5 nanosecond length, which is inverse of that one, is that roughly. Then this delta t should be less than this. This should be greater, much greater than delta t, so that I can capture these pulses. Do you follow me? So this delta t that I have in here, if I call this thing my measurement bandwidth W, that's the bandwidth that I'm sweeping. Okay, this delta T that I have, delta T, which is distance in the time, should be at least less than one over W. Huh? So I have two constraints so far. Huh? 1 over delta F should be greater than tau sub M. Delta T should be less than 1 over W. Otherwise, I don't get my pulses. Make sense? So I have sample signal periodic in time. OK. And those samples that I'm making should be good enough that I resolve the parses or resolve the multipath component. OK? Now, so that's good. I think that's the general picture. Do you have any question regarding that? This is what I have to do. Hmm? Again, about measurement, the same way as before. 
my measurement time should be so that before channel changes I have one snapshot of the channel what if it's a slow for example the network analyzer that we had originally was doing one measurement for 400 milliseconds I mean I wanted to do the measurements in 5 milliseconds because my Doppler spectrum was like 10 in the indoor areas when people are moving so I can't do it with that so what I do is that when I want to do measurement I come on Sundays nobody is around I put my transmitter and receiver I take my channel snapshot and when I'm taking channel snapshots I don't let people move and that's it what happens if they move it's not that sensitive these are statistical models even if they move it's not that important really because movements in 400 that's not that important because we get one snapshot of everything is so statistically distributed that it's not a major problem if people move but in order to make sure we stop people from movement okay now what about the windows these are a bunch of those windows I have like rectangular window this one see that's a bad one because the side lobe is like 13 dB down then I have Bartlett Bartlett is a triangular window and then I have Hanning and Hanning windows they have a special equations for them I have only the figures this is like this one is the triangular the one under that is Hanning I believe and the next one is Hanning okay this one Hamming window the one that I have in here looks like the best because all the side lobes are at the same level if I come to Hamming Hamming gradually comes the first one is relatively low but comes lower and lower for our purpose I have multi-path environment I want to have like I mean any path I mean so if the side lobes are straight that's good for me so Hamming looks like one of the ideal ones for me you follow because I mean in the filters like if I'm designing like a filter to separate two channels I would like that at least I mean it goes down I mean if I'm not interfering with the next channel I mean if I'm interfering with the next channel at least I'm not interfering the one after so something which comes down is good but for my purpose I have like multi paths that I want to detect so if it's a straight that's fine so Hamming looks like one of the better ones but you can pick up whenever whichever you want I think Hamming was the one that Steve picked up and used for his measurement for this reason these are typical measurements this is the channel impulse response and these are the time response this one is uh, using a rectangular window and this one is using a Hamming window Hamming window was the good one now you look at that see this is the peak of the first path peak of the second path peak of the first second path now, in here uh, you have like narrower pulses much narrower pulses in, in here than here not much I mean this is around like 5 nanosecond this is around 7 8 nanosecond okay but you come to the side lobe this one the top is like 0.12 here I mean this is the background noise which is like 100 times less than that more than 100 times less than that something like that around that these are the noise level but look at this one the noise level is another like 20 dB below what I have in here do you follow me these are noise level the end of the noise peak is the path that I want to detect in here I have the peaks like I mean this background noise around 0.01 in here is uh, 0.01 in here is around 0.001 at least 10 dB more than that do you follow me this comes reflection of this thing in frequency domain difference between this one and this one here the side lobe starts from 13 gradually comes down and on the average this one and this one are how much apart something like let's say 20 dB apart something this one is minus 44 this one in this areas is like 30 
20 something, 28, something like that. Like 10, 15 dB below that in the middle. But worst case is in here, at the close to this one, I have like 13 dB versus 44, which is like 30 dB apart. Okay? So the paths which are closed, and then when they go at the end, they are different. But when I come to here, I'm just comparing the end. Okay, so I'm talking about this part, comparing this thing with this thing, which is around 15 dB apart, something like that. At the beginning, they were like 30 dB apart. You follow me? So that's the issue. The compromise between rectangular and Hamming window is compromised between resolution versus signal to noise ratio. Signal to noise ratio is the ratio of this thing to this thing. This thing to this thing. Okay? And these are actually in dB. I mean, each click that you have in here is like 10 dB. 10 dB different. Okay? Now, basically, these are some result of measurement of RMS delay spread. Uh, the first measurements, extensive measurements of RMS delay spread and indoor radio channels for using frequency domain measurement, as I have said it before, was done uh, by Steve Howard in here in WPI. And these are his results. There are several areas. Uh, some of them are like uh, the global he calls it, some of them he calls them local, and some are mix. Global means that uh, you go over different area, a large area, every one meter you do some measurements. Local means in one location you do many, many. And mixed means a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Means that you do nine measurements in one location, then you go two meter away, you do nine more measurements. That's the mixed one. And these are like result of measurement. If you want to compare these RMS delay measurements that he has with RMS delay measurements that maybe Ganesh did using time domain uh, techniques, which are things like that. Mm, there is things like this, for example, like this. These are the ones that you can compare around the similar areas. In general, uh, in frequency domain measurement, RMS delay spread is a little bit less spreaded. In time domain, it gets a little bit more spreaded. Because in time domain, when you have this channel impulse response, if you pick one of the packed paths, see, your noise is not side lobe noise, which is controlled. Noise floor in time domain is noise floor in time domain is something like this. This is caused by noise itself. It's not controlled. But this in the frequency domain, what was this? This was the side lobe. So in frequency domain it's easier really to like detect, put a threshold in here. In time domain, sometimes we make mistakes. If you make mistake and you take a path in here, for example, this increases the multipath spread a lot because it's second central moment. If tau goes large and then suddenly you make an error, it increases tau RMS a lot. So if you go to measurements like, like this one, for example, uh, in, in like Ganesh's measurements, for example, something like these areas. These are very large. Suddenly, from here to here, I have flat areas. Means that nothing has happened in between. And suddenly, I have very large ones. These large ones are sub subject to mistake. Could be. Mistake of the form that I told you. In frequency domain measurements, you don't have that. Okay. In here, signal to noise ratio is low. Signal to noise ratio is very low. Since signal to noise ratio, you pick up erroneous paths and you think they are path, 
and suddenly you get RMS delay spread which is like 150, 160 anybody who was doing time domain they was making this type of errors sometimes I mean from results of uh, Ted Rappaport sometimes he had like RMS delay spread which is like 350 but Steve never got things like that in the indoor areas he always was very much more uh, confined in a sense and that's one of the perhaps advantages of frequency domain measurement so these are like frequency correlation function these are relationship correlations which are not that important the statistics of measurements these are not that important because we are talking about only channel measurement systems in here now uh, so basically these frequency domain measurement systems uh, the way that uh, they work is they take the frequency domain, they apply a filter, they take the inverse Fourier transform. Okay. And since they were simple, a lot of people are using that for short distance measurements these days. It's the most popular. Now, uh, actually, we can uh, continue on this part. I wanted to have this in a separate video but I will keep it still in this video. I continue on this one. These are advances in frequency domain measurements systems. This frequency domain measurement systems more recently have been used in time of arrival measurements, have been used for super resolution algorithms, for angle of arrival measurements, and ultra wideband measurement systems. Now, for time of arrival, issues which are related to this I want to go over them like in 10 minutes very quickly because uh, time wise I'm under pressure number one for time of arrival if you want to measure the time of arrival some of my students recently they have measured this type of things and uh, uh, basically you want to measure the arrival of the first path this is what you want to measure Okay. And now, if you make an error in the peak between two samples, let's say if you're taking your samples, if the width of the pulse is 5 nanoseconds, if you take them 1 nanosecond apart, how much was 1 nanosecond in meters? It's 30 centimeters error. Okay. If your samples are like three nanoseconds apart, it's like one meter error. So you have to be very careful. So you have to take a lot of samples in the time domain so that you can avoid that type of thing. Okay. But that's one thing that we can mention about it. About super resolution algorithms. Just to give you an idea about super resolution algorithms. See, in reality, uh, what has happened is uh, there is a wide body of literature in there on spectral estimation what is the purpose of those spectral estimation thing is that people are collecting the time domain data like this so this is a seismic signal they put some sensors on the ground and they measure the vibrations in the earth Okay, and then they want to detect the frequency component of that. What is the rate of movements? The same as what we uh, the Doppler that we do. Okay, and often they want to separate them from one another. This is called like uh, a spectral estimation techniques, and we have courses for that. For example, in WPI is 534, which are different techniques that you apply to the time domain signal so that if you have two frequencies in frequency domain and they are close to one another you can detect them this is the essence of a spectral estimation technique they have parametric and non-parametric techniques and well established many techniques like that okay now in frequency domain measurement techniques we can take all of those algorithms, modify them, and apply it here for another purpose. In frequency domain measurement techniques, 
we measure the frequency response and then we want to take the inverse of that and if we have two paths which are close to one another we want to detect them so basically that's exactly the same concept of spectral estimation and the same algorithms can be applied but when I apply it into the into like uh, frequency domain measurements really I'm trying to improve the resolution in time resolution was what width of these pulses I was doing like windowing windowing is an spectral estimation technique they use windowing for a spectral estimation technique they have windowed periodogram for example is one of, one of the techniques and that's what I was using earlier but except that they have other techniques which are parametric spectral estimation techniques okay just like music algorithm for example music algorithm is a very traditional time domain technique to be applied to improve the resolution of a spectral estimation you can use exactly the same thing to what to frequency domain measured data to improve the resolution in frequency domain uh, sorry in time domain from the result of frequency domain measurements in particular these are very very helpful when I'm talking about positioning because in positioning I want to take the first path if first path is combined with the second path I will have a lot of errors so if I apply super resolution I'm going to get better estimation this is an example of that done with my last PhD student Jim Rang Lee which is now a professor at University of Texas this is like the result of his work so he looks at four algorithms the first two are basically direct sequence spread spectrum and inverse Fourier transform which are with and without window you take the frequency domain measurements and you take the inverse of that okay your first path is supposed to arrive in here okay in this case the same the first path is supposed to arrive in here now since your bandwidth was very wide the first path gets combined with other paths and then you get this thing and then you think that the first path has arrived in here if you, now you apply super resolution algorithm to this guy you get these two peaks you're decomposing the paths and you get exact location of the arrival this is a very very popular technique recently a lot of people are using that around so this is that super resolution this technique I mean he has measured the channel in frequency domain and the channel was something like this he takes the inverse Fourier transform he gets something like that he puts window on inverse he gets something like that he applies super resolution a spectral estimation techniques he gets something like this here see this was where I wanted the first path to be and here is where I have detected the difference between these two looks like something like 10 nanosecond maybe more like 20 30 nanosecond 20 nanosecond is how many meters of error in the I mean if you are using that for time of arrival of the first path and you have 20 nanosecond error you have like 6 meters error and the distance between transmitter and the delay is indoor like 10 meters you make 6 meters error you apply the super resolution algorithm you reduce that to close to zero okay but what what have you done you have used the same spectral estimation techniques that was used in the uh, in the spectral estimation techniques for many years past 20 years but this is modified and adopted to our measurement so this is the story of super resolution algorithm super resolution where make the paths see I have many many paths they resolve the paths they resolve all the paths in particular in telecommunication I'm interested in RMS delay spread that's not important if I have more refined but in geolocation application if I have more refined thing it's very important and just past two three years it has picked up a lot of publicity this particular work actually and now people are doing research in that so that was super resolution next one is the issue of angle of arrival 
who is interested in angle of arrival measurements people are interested in angle of arrival who are doing MIMO MIMO basically is multiple input multiple output antennas okay and if you want to do MIMO and you want to do some measurement for MIMO now you have to know that the paths which are arriving are arriving from which angle this is something that everybody wants to know one of the first work which was done in that was done by Spencer in around the year 2000 and Spencer is a graduate of uh, Stanford and he's teaching in some of the universities is in the reference list reference list of the uh, revised chapter uh, that I distributed here but anyways the basic concept that he has used is uh, he takes like an antenna he put it over like it's a very it's a directional antenna it's an antenna which has like a dish it is it has a very very narrow beam for arrival and then he puts it over a plate and he moves the plate every angle like every five degrees or two degrees three degrees and he measures the receive signal power in those things transmitter the antenna is a omnidirectional antenna so this way I'm receiving paths from different angles I associate them to them so basically now if I have like well I can do it actually in here if originally in my previous measurements I was doing channel impulse response like that okay but I didn't know that what is the angle of arrival in here in here if he has measured this one with the phase with the angle of zero of this dish this is a dish that I'm changing its angle if the angle of the dish is zero so this path is associated to zero degrees this one was collected when the angle was 30 degrees so this is 30 degrees so in addition to tau that I traditionally had not for each of these paths now I have a value of tau which happens to be zero and a value of theta this is tau which is time of arrival a theta which is angle of arrival so I do everything I mean in here I have the tau of 20 nanosecond and I have angle of let's say 60 degrees now if I have that type of thing now I can do analysis of MIMO or anything which uses the so called space diversity this is one of the early but I'm talking about measurement system this is the simplest measurement system okay but it's mechanical it's very difficult to be implemented another approach to this one was an approach that Bob Tingley another PhD student of mine did around the same time and Bob Tingley is now in Draper's lab in Massachusetts and what he did he put like eight antennas antenna elements and these antenna elements on on a sync circle like this and he has an omnidirectional in the other end so he sends the signal he receives eight impulse responses and then he processes he uses a spectral estimation technique to find the value of the beta which is amplitude phase of arrival time of arrival and phase of arrival okay using a spectral estimation techniques now this is his antennas these are those eight impulse responses that he receives with these eight antennas and these are like input typical two-dimensional impulse responses that he has measured is much more elegant and also it's much more accurate than what Spencer has done then if you use a spectral estimation techniques you can estimate the location and the phase of arrival and these are estimation of the location and phase of arrival of the paths okay here is like uh, one of them is the time of arrival this is the tau this is phase of arrival phase goes between 0 to 360 degrees okay but the amplitudes are changing I mean tau goes between 0 up to 300 nanosecond he's doing indoor so 
spread is up to 300 nanosecond. Phase is up to 180. So you see the phase of arrival of the path. The last but not the least element in here, how about ultra-wideband measurements? If you want to go for channel measurement for ultra-wideband, again, frequency domain channel measurements are widely used. The only difference is that I'm making the band wider. The ones that I had earlier, the bandwidth was how much? 200 megahertz. For that, I was using omnidirectional antennas, etc. But when I go for 1 gigahertz or 2 gigahertz bandwidth, I have to change my antennas. Typical antennas that they are using are either bow antennas or this is like cone antennas. It's a cone and it has a hat on top of that. These are some results of measurements using this antenna, which is done actually in my laboratory. And other people are doing this type of measurements. And they are very popular for modeling for WPAN, edu.15.3. And inside the subcommittee also, they have used similar setting and frequency domain measurements to collect and model for that. And this would be actually perhaps uh, the last part of the lecture, but I come back again to your project. Your project are measurements in this building, and I have given you measurements of this sort, and you're analyzing that, and we have given you the locations, and like the distances, and you analyze the received signal, you find the peaks, and you play with the measurements to see that what will happen to the measurements. Uh, so, basically, with that one, I will finish my um, part three of uh, lecture five. Actually, I was planning to have part three and four. I combined the three and four because I was under pressure uh, time-wise. Uh, and if you have any questions... So other than that, I will see you in next week.